Okay, we start the recording. You can go. The floor is yours, Feliciano. Thanks a lot. Uh, okay. Uh, well, you know, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, apologies for not being there, and thank you for having me. Uh, so this is uh, Feliciano Justino, and I'm currently uh, at um, uh, UT Austin. And today I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, uh, you know electron flow interactions. So this is going to be a very general, uh, you know, light touch introduction. Uh, and then trying to uh, motivate why one uh, functions are, are so important in, the, in this field. Uh, so I, I think I, I'm planning to talk like maybe 45 minutes. So if you want to interrupt at any point, uh, just uh, feel free to do that. Uh, but I don't see any kind of camera. So if you want to interrupt, just say yell or do something like that, okay? Uh, first of all, let me uh, tell you where I'm sitting now. So I'm actually located in a, Austin, Texas, so this is basically uh, approximately here, is in the center of the state of Texas, is the capital city. So we are in the south of the US. Uh, so Austin is known for a couple of things. So the first one is that um, it's a kind of a hippie city. Uh, so the motto is uh, keep Austin weird. Uh, so as a result, we have a lot of graffiti art. So this is one of my favorites is uh, Michael Sieben, one of the uh, uh, local uh, graffiti artists in Austin. So the second important thing is that Austin is the is a, you know, an important tech hub in, in, in Texas. So it basically hosts a very large number of uh, you know, uh, tech companies. Uh, maybe you, you, you know Dell Computers. So this was born here in Austin. So Tesla, you probably heard that has relocated its headquarters from California to here in Austin. Samsung is building the, the largest manufacturing plant, uh, cheap manufacturing plant in the US. So there is really a lot of activity in this area. And this also creating pressure for a university because it's very difficult to keep PhD students until the end because companies snatch them uh, before they finish. Um, at this moment, I'm actually sitting in what is called the Odin Institute. Uh, it's basically um, a, a, a unit in the uh, University of Texas. It is entirely devoted to uh, computational science. So the way it works is that we are approximately uh, 40 faculty and all of us have a dual appointment, one with a standard department, like, I don't know, uh, in my case, physics, others are engineering, maybe chemistry. And then half of the appointment is with this institute, where uh, essentially everybody has an interest in something ranging from applied mathematics to high performance computing. And I will tell you a little bit more about that later. But now let me get started with electron volume physics. Uh, so the, uh, what I'm going to do now is to uh, give you three examples of why we care about this uh, phenomena. And then I will uh, try to, uh, you know, uh, give you a little bit of background about the theory before, uh, you know, showing you some applications. So this uh, uh, first example is about um, uh, transistors. So this is a pretty figure from uh, the group of Anders Fisch at EPFL. Uh, approximately 10 years ago, they, they built the first, uh, um, you know, transistor made of a 2D material. So this would be a, 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 a illustration, a kind of a artistic rendering of a transistor based on molybdenum sulfide. And when you do something like that, one of the key quantities uh, is uh, the response of the electrons to applied fields between the source and the drain. And this is quantified in terms of the uh, electron mobility. So the mobility is basically the, let's say the coefficient of proportionality between the average velocity of the electrons and the applied electric field. Uh, so the higher the mobility, the faster you can switch a uh, transistor. Uh, so you can see that the, this quantity, this is experiments, uh, actually depends uh, 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 strongly on temperature. Okay, it goes down by two orders of magnitude with temperature. And this is a, a, a kind of a manifestation of electron volume interactions. Uh, in practice, what is happening is that the atoms in the lattice uh, vibrate with larger amplitudes as you increase the temperature, and therefore uh, there is more scattering of the electrons and the mobility is decreased. So that's the kind of thing we would like to calculate, for example, using uh, uh, these techniques. A second example that maybe is not known to, to many is that um, uh, uh, solar cells actually, uh, you know, are kind of uh, uh, functioning uh, mostly because of electron flow interactions, if you want. Maybe it's an exaggeration, but let me explain what I mean. If you look at the uh, solar cells you see on the rooftops, so these are essentially assemblies of uh, cells like this one, so on a solar panel, but it's essentially silicon. And you know that silicon is an indirect gap semiconductor. Uh, meaning that there is a first fundamental gap at about uh, one electron volts, so 1.1. And that's an indirect gap between uh, the gamma point and the X point approximately. And then there is a, a direct transition uh, between gamma and gamma at about 3.3 electron volts. So you know that when you absorb light, uh, uh, you know, in the present, so if you want to absorb a photon, you need to conserve the momentum. So in practice, this means that the only processes that are allowed 
if you have only photons in the system, are direct processes. So silicon should start absorbing approximately at three electron volts. And that means that the entire solar spectrum that con is con consists of the uh, visible light and infrared light uh, would be completely missed. Okay, so that would be useful, uh, useless, sorry. Um, so the reason why there is absorption in this range is that uh, there exists uh, things called um, uh, phonon assisted optical processes where uh, uh, the system can absorb both a, um, a photon and a phonon, or maybe absorb a photon and emit a phonon. And the involvement of the, photo, of the phonon uh, uh, essentially allows the electrons to change momentum in the Brillouin zone, okay? So this entire uh, kind of section of the absorption of silicon comes from um, electron phonon interactions. And actually, even more interestingly, it comes from zero point fluctuations, okay? So if you go to a very low temperature, uh, this remains pretty much the same. The third example I just want to, to uh, uh, you know, show you is about superconductivity. Uh, so that's probably the most uh, striking manifestation of electron phonon interactions. And uh, the, the phenomenon is the following, uh, you know, in two words, that uh, you have a metal, uh, for example, uh, uh, you, have a, you can measure the resistivity, then you go down in temperature, resistivity decreases. And at some point, uh, the resistivity drops completely to zero. So you lose in, entirely the, the, the electrical resisti the resistance and you have a superconducting phase. So the, the, the first mechanism to be proposed and you know, the one that we really understand today is a BCS mechanism whereby you know, two electrons uh, uh, form pairs as a result of an attractive interaction uh, due to phonons. And uh, the, the plots that you see here are from this work uh, uh, where essentially uh, they uh, found uh, uh, that uh, by compressing you know, hydrogen-based materials at extremely high pressure, so we're talking about 200 GPA here, uh, you can form a, a, a metal that actually has very high uh, superconducting critical temperature. So in this case, it's maybe 200 Kelvin and more recently there's been work showing that one can even reach a uh, room temperature. So the, the, the smoking gun, or let's say the, the kind of proof, uh, experimental proof that you, are that you have phonons involved is usually the isotopic experiment, isotopic substitution experiment, which consists of taking this compound and uh, replacing some elements with something lighter uh, or uh, heavier in terms of uh, isotopic uh, content. Uh, so this example is essentially going from um, a sulfur hydride to sulfur deuteride. So deuterium is uh, heavier than uh, the hydrogen. Therefore, you expect the vibrational frequencies to um, decrease. And uh, uh, if the BCS theory is correct, what you should observe is a, a decrease in the critical temperature, as you can see here, okay? So that's another manifestation of, of um, you know, electron volume interactions. So how do we study this uh, uh, phenomena? Uh, so what I want to, uh, what I usually do uh, in this kind of uh, uh, introductions is to start from the, from a very simple, uh, like elementary introduction to the problem uh, using some uh, heuristic arguments, because usually that is um, easier to digest. And uh, today I'm gonna change a little bit the, the you know, the, the, the angle. So I want to start from the difficult side, uh, just to give you an idea of, uh, you know, the complexity of these problems and, you know, the, the kind of, the tools that have been developed over the years to, to address them, okay? So we start from the most general, um, you know, Hamiltonian for a coupled system of electrons and phonons. So in this case, uh, the wave function would be a wave function describing both electrons and uh, in this case, nuclei. So the electron uh, position would be R sub I and the nucleus position would be tau sub K. And here you have all the interactions uh, between these particles. For example, you have, uh, you know, um, the red bits here and here would be the electronic Hamiltonian where you have kinetic energy and then the Coulomb repulsion between electrons. You would have blue bits here and here. Again, kinetic energy of the nuclei and then a, a Coulomb repulsion between nuclei. And then there is this magenta uh, uh, term that is a uh, Coulomb interaction between electrons and nuclei. So that's an attractive component, okay? So V here in all the cases is defined below and it represents uh, very simply the uh, Coulomb interaction between two charges. So in principle, we would like to solve this equation, but actually this is very difficult. Now, you, you, I'm, I'm sure you know that um, one could um, use quantum Monte Carlo techniques to solve for the electronic problem, you know, to attack a, a Hamiltonian looking at that. And that is fine, but if you try to move on to uh, incorporate also the nuclei, things become much more challenging. And the reason being that the nuclear wave functions are much, much narrower than electronic wave functions. So not only you have the problem of correlations, but you also have a problem of multi-scale um, uh, nature because uh, you know there are really different length scales for nuclei and electrons. 
So one approach that has uh, you know, essentially been popular and is probably the, the most rigorous way we have today to describe these problems is to move from a representation in real space to a uh, representation in Fox space. And I will try to explain what I mean in a second. So the idea essentially is to try not to work with the complete wave function that depends on the coordinates of all this, the, the particles in the system, but to express that as a linear combination of slated determinants. So this is very typical in uh, quantum chemistry. For example, what we could uh, uh, do is uh, to take a, uh, a slated determinant, so this knot here, uh, made of, for example, the uh, valence uh, 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 Kohn-Sham states. Okay, so that's not exact, but it's uh, you know one possible determinant. And then we could construct uh, linear combinations of uh, modifications of those. For example, I could uh, uh, apply this uh, destruction operator to remove an electron in the state n, and then the construction operator to add it to another state m. And this would be a modified determinant where the n state is empty and the m state is occupied. And this is what we call a single uh, uh, excitation. Now, this is not going to be the description of the ground state or the excited state we want to look at, but I can take linear combinations to be more accurate, for example. And I could also do the same by looking at more complex constructions. For example, I can remove two electrons and then I add them somewhere else. So this would be double excitations and then I can do triple excitations and so on. Okay. So this is just to say that. Uh, 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 by working in the space of slated determinants, it is possible to transfer the uh, uh, complexity from a real space dependence of these variables to uh, the coefficients that we don't know here. Okay. In practice, uh, uh, you know, in, in solid state physics, we don't usually work with these coefficients because things get uh, complicated quite quickly. And there is one extra step which makes our life much, much simpler. And that is the following. So what we do is to take linear combinations of these uh, uh, field operators or this um, uh, creation annihilation operators. For example, this is a linear combination of these structural operators where the coefficient is the value of, let's say, a Kohn-Sham state at a given point, okay? And when you do this, you are defining an operator that uh, depends parametrically on the uh, coordinate in real space. So why this is useful? Well, this is extremely useful because if you take the Hamiltonian I showed you in the previous slide, uh, you can discover, you know, by just looking at the standard textbook on uh, second quantization, that that can be rewritten in a very simple way. For example, if you have a, a sum of uh, uh, single particle potentials, for example, imagine the uh, uh, interaction between electrons and nuclei, and this would be a summation over all the electrons, this can be rewritten as a single integral of the potential over this, uh, uh, you know, expectation value of this, of this potential over the, uh, uh, this field operator. So the advantage here is that essentially we get rid of all the coordinates, all the particles, and we are left with a single coordinate, okay? Clearly the disadvantage is that uh, uh, we are not talking about a wave function, but a operator. So that complicates our life a little bit, but that's not uh, too much of an issue. So what happens to the Hamiltonian I showed you earlier? Well, in practice, we, have, we will have five terms as uh, before, so kinetic energies and then the, the, the electrostatic interactions. And these electrostatic interactions in this new representation take a very simple form. For example, the electron nucleus interaction can be written as a essentially a, a, a Coulomb integral of two densities, the electron density, the nuclear densities. Uh, and so that's essentially just a pure electrostatics. And notice that I don't have any more the variables of all the electrons and all the nuclei. I just have the a one variable for the electron density and one position variable for the nuclear density. Similarly, if you look at the electron-electron interaction, that also becomes extremely simple in this kind of, at least formally, and that is essentially just a Hartree uh, uh, interaction. So you take the electron density, multiply with itself, and then you divide by the distance between two electrons by the Coulomb interaction. And in this case, you also take care of uh, removing the spurious um, uh, self-interaction of electrons. So it's like if uh, by doing this, using this formalism, you really reduce the problem to uh, something looking like a kind of a Hartree problem. Uh, the only difference between these and Hartree is that uh, these are not uh, uh, kind of C numbers or you know, real numbers, these are actually operators, okay? And just to be clear, the uh, electron density operator is essentially the product of two field operators, uh, uh, creation and then destruction operators. So uh, what do we do with these things? Um, so once uh, you have this Hamiltonian, what the people would like to calculate uh, is the Green's function. In this case, uh, it's for an electron, but it can also be calculated for uh, phonons, for example. So this is a particular version of the Green's function called time ordered. And it's just a, a, a you know, version that is useful for certain applications in the ground state. 
So time, time order means essentially the times here uh, increase towards the, the left, but that's only a detail. So that's a, a definition of Green's function. What it is, as you can see, it's a the expectation model of these field operators over this state that I call N. So this is essentially the ground state of the system, let's say a neutral uh, you know, uh, crystal, maybe imagine an insulator with field valence bands. So let's try to understand what people mean by this expression and why it was invented in this way. So if I focus on the on this side, so what I just highlighted in blue, so this corresponds to taking the ground state and creating an electron at the point R prime and at the time T prime, okay? So this represent the ground state plus an electron at the space time point R prime T prime. If you now look at the left hand side and just ignore for a second the uh, uh, VIX operator, so what you discover is basically that uh, uh, we, we have essentially the Hermitian conjugate of what I just described. So here we have the ground state with an extra electron at the space time point R and T. So really, uh, this Green's function is a scalar product, or inner product between two states where an electron has been added to the system and is now in two different places. So this is what people call the propagator of uh, the electron, essentially is the probability amplitude for an electron to go from uh, an initial space time point to a final one, all right? And this contains a lot of information about the, the electronic system. For example, one can prove that if you take the Fourier transform in time, so in T minus T prime, uh, and you go in the frequency domain, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the poles of this function give you the uh, excitation energies of the system. It means the energy needed to, to basically uh, uh, add or remove electrons to the system or uh, electronic excitations and things like that, okay? So in practice, from this green function, you can obtain uh, things like uh, uh, many body bond structures. The way people do it is to fully transform also the, the position operator here, the position variables in k-space, and therefore you will have a function that is resolved both in momentum and in frequency. So from this function in practice, what one does is to build the spectral density function that is simply the imaginary part of the Green's function. And that is, uh, if you want, a density of states, uh, not the consham density of states, but uh, the many body density of states. So typically what happens when you construct these things is the following. I, I will give you just a cartoon example and then I'll show you with a couple of um, uh, you know, applications. So you start from something like uh, you know, DFT calculation, you will have a uh, density of states. In this case, I consider only one state, uh, just for simplicity. Uh, this state in DFT is um, uh, uh, basically a, a stationary state, a solution of the constant equations. So that means it is uh, infinitely lived uh, and the uh, density of states is a sharp uh, Dirac delta functions, right? So if you switch on interactions between electrons or between electrons and nuclei like phonons, and what happens typically is the following. This uh, density of states gets deformed and the deformation can be described uh, uh, qualitatively in the following way. First, the peak has moved, okay? It's no longer in the original position. That means the, um, uh, the excitation energy has changed a little bit. And this is what we will call the quasi-particle shift. Uh, the other change is that the peak is no longer sharp, so now it's uh, 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 slightly broad, and this uh, uh, is a signature of the fact that the electron has acquired a finite lifetime, it means it's not going to be there forever. And then uh, you also have additional structure here, usually this is incoherent structure, that is much, actually in this case it's exaggerated, but maybe in general cases maybe 10 or 20 percent of the weight of the main peak, and this has to do with the uh, interactions with, for example, uh, bosons that could be you know, phonons could be plasmons, could be uh, magnons, uh, and uh, maybe electron hole pair excitations and things like that. Okay. So um, once uh, uh, you know you, you understand that you know this is what one can calculate. Is that the next question is uh, you know how do we obtain the, the uh, this Green's function and this uh, spectral function? So the way it works is uh, uh, quite straightforward. In practice, we define field operators uh, that depend on time uh, by simply using uh, the Heisenberg representation. And then from that, you can derive the uh, equation of motion for these field operators. Essentially, it's like a Schrodinger's equation for these operators. In this commutator, you can evaluate it uh, using the Hamiltonian I gave you uh, on a couple of slides uh, uh, back. And uh, one can prove that that's the, the result that you obtain. So you have a kinetic energy and then some kind of potential acting on the uh, electron field operators. So this expression actually is very beautiful because uh, if you think about it, uh, uh, if you remove the hat in these operators, that would be ex ex exactly the, the equation of motion of an electron in the Hartree uh, approximation, okay? 
So in this is a Coulomb potential, and this will be the density of, for example, the electrons. Uh, the, the challenge here is that uh, we have uh, hats, so these are operators, so things are not so simple. So what one does at this point is to consider if you have an evolution uh, equation of motion for the field operators, and since the Green's function is defined in terms of field operators, you can use this expression to derive the equation of motion for the Green's function, and then to obtain its, uh, uh, let's say, poles and for the excitation energies. So the equation of motion for the Green's function derived from the first line here uh, looks like this. So the left-hand side is a standard, um, let's say, Schrodinger type um, uh, uh, kind of um, uh, part of the equation. This will give the energy of Emmanuel, and this will be, give the kinetic energy. So what you see on the right is essentially the potential part. And here the complexity uh, starts to show. So remember that um, the electron density here, for example, is a product of two field operators. So here we really have four field operators, and that's really uh, uh, complicated to describe. So this is what contains things like the Hartley energy, the Fock exchange energy. There is a two particle Green's functions, there is electron phone interactions. So this self energy, so this, uh, this uh, term here contains a little bit of everything. So at this point, this will be pretty hopeless, but uh, uh, um, this is some uh, kind of, uh, you know, the pioneers in our field, um, uh, uh, maybe in the fifties, they uh, derived techniques to deal with this in, in a kind of systematic fashion. And the basic idea is to replace this uh, uh, difficult uh, term here by the product of a self energy and the Green's function itself. So in, if you want the self energy here is actually defined in such a way as uh, to have this integral being equal to the difficult expression I showed you in the previous slide, okay? And uh, what one can do is to do some maths to find out precisely what the self energy is. So what I want to say here is that in practice, in this expression, we can uh, uh, see already something looking like a Schrodinger's equation uh, and uh, the electron phonon interactions enter through this potential here. This potential depends on the uh, exact, let's say ground state density. And these are also the, uh, contains the nuclear quantum fluctuations. So for example, it contains the fact that nuclei are not uh, uh, strictly localized in a point because they are quantum particles. And this term here contains uh, things like dynamical renormalization and other, you know, uh, uh, correlation effects that one wants to incorporate. Okay, so uh, one can do a little bit of maths to figure out what is the self energy. So I'm going to just show you the, the main terms uh, without deriving it, uh, uh, and I will use a graphical representation just because it's easier to uh, remember. So the self energy contains essentially three terms. There are two other terms that are very small, so I will not discuss them. So the first one is something that you might have seen in other contexts. So this is essentially the GW self energy, meaning that um, you have an, uh, a product of an electron uh, line. So this is the Green's function and the screen cool interaction between electrons. And this is a, a vertex that in typical calculations uh, uh, one neglects because it's very difficult to evaluate. Then there is another term that uh, is similar in shape, uh, but in this case, instead of having the um, the uh, uh, screen cool interaction, we have the phonon propagator here. So that would be the phonon Green's function. So this is the form of a electron Green's function times phonon Green's function times a electron phonon matrix element here and here times the same vertex we have on the top. So in practice, also in this case, the vertex is usually neglected because it's very difficult to evaluate. And this is uh, what we call the Farming self energy. And then there is one last term that is a little bit weird is essentially a self energy where there is no electron line and the phonon line folds upon itself. Okay, so this is what is called the Debye Waller self energy. Uh, however, I should be uh, a little bit uh, uh, careful here. So that's not exactly a self energy. Uh, actually, if I can go back a couple of slides, uh, this comes from this potential term here, and in particular from the uh, uh, fuzziness of the atomic, uh, 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 you know, nuclei, the positions around the equilibrium. Okay, so it's not a dynamic self energy in a way. So what can we do with this self energy? So once we can calculate them, so what I'm going to do now is to um, uh, uh, show you uh, some applications of this uh, concept, and then uh, uh, I will uh, go back a little bit to more details on how we uh, perform calculations. Okay. So I'm going to show you uh, three applications. One is going to be about the mass renormalization. Uh, the second one is going to be about uh, 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 photo emission satellites. And the third one is going to be about uh, uh, inelastic excess scattering on phonons, OK? So the first one is about, uh, this is just an example that we've been working on in the past on, on uh, perovskites. So the perovskite structure is basically a material with um, uh, uh, atoms arranged in uh, octahedra that are connected by the corners. In this case, uh, you have lead in the middle, 
iodine in the uh, corners. And then in the middle of these uh, 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 cavities, uh, there is a molecule uh, called metal ammonium. So this is CH3 and H3. And that's, uh, this material is, uh, is uh, as attracted attention because uh, uh, it, um, you know, some modifications of this compound have led to uh, solar cell materials with efficiencies that, uh, uh, you know, are competitive with, uh, you know, kind of the state of the art in silicon. So a lot of people are working on that. So one of the questions in these compounds and in the physics of this compound is, uh, you know, what is the effect of phonons on their properties? So what you can see in the middle is a calculation of the spectral density function, what I was showing earlier. Um, and basically you have the wave vector on the uh, horizontal axis, the energy on the vertical axis. And what I'm doing here is to show is showing the conduction band and the, and the, and the valence band. And I'm uh, 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 basically setting the energy axis so that uh, the bottom of the conduction is zero and the top of the valence is zero. And you need to imagine that in the middle, there is approximately a band up of 1.6 electron volts. So if you do DFT calculations, uh, uh, you will find uh, uh, this uh, uh, dashed blue line. I'm not sure you can see it, but I'm trying to point at it with uh, my uh, pointer. So this will be standard uh, uh, DFT band structure. If you use this uh, fan middle self energy that I mentioned, uh, you obtain uh, the plot shown in yellow and purple. So you basically see the spectral density function that is a yellow line uh, that is a relatively sharp band at the bottom here, but you can see that it's slightly uh, uh, flatter than the previous one. So uh, what we say is that the mass has increased in this case. So the mass has increased as a result of electron phonon interactions. And this can be seen uh, uh, in this diagram here at the bottom. So basically uh, uh, we typically uh, quantify the mass increase by a parameter called lambda that is defined so that one plus lambda is the increase in the mass. So if lambda, lambda is equal to 0.3, it means that the mass is increased by 30%. So in this system, phonons increase the mass by something between 20 and 40% of low temperature, depending on the specific uh, uh, approach you use to perform the calculation. The second uh, property you can uh, uh, obtain from this uh, calculation is that you see that the bands are very sharp. So this yellow line, uh, uh, you know, up to a certain energy. And at some point, everything becomes very, very broad, okay? You almost lose the notion of, uh, you know, kind of a sharp band or, or a band structure. So this uh, can be quantified by looking at the width of this, uh, of this spectrum. So this is the, uh, uh, the broadening of the quasi-particle. And it's plotted here as a function of energy. So at low energy, uh, up to, uh, let's say here, you have uh, almost no broadening, so it will be this range here. And then you have a sharp jump, and then it remains something of the order of maybe 50 milli electron volts. Uh, so what is happening here is that the electron of this energy is able to emit a longitudinal optical phonon, and as a result, its, um, uh, its lifetime gets uh, decreases. And in particular, in this case, the lifetime becomes something of the order of 20, 20 seconds, okay? So this is something that people are interested in uh, for things like transport or um, you know studying of photo excitations and things like that. So the second example is a much simpler compound. Uh, uh, so this is a rock salt compound. Uh, it's called a europium oxide. Essentially, is a um, kind of a cubic arrangement of europium and, and oxygen. So just to give you some background, uh, so this compound actually um, is uh, you know important conceptually because it is the only material. It is the only let's say semiconductor that is as a fully uh, spin polarized bands. So for example, if you perform a calculation using uh, DFT plus U, you will find that uh, both the uh, valence band top and the conduction band bottom have uh, a, you know, a spin oriented in the same direction. So this could act as a perfect spin filter. And this actually was found experimentally, you know, uh, maybe uh, 10 years ago. Uh, the only complication is that uh, this uh, phase is not stable at room temperature, so this becomes the European sesqui oxide, so it's not really useful for applications, but it's actually a proof of concept that one can achieve fully spin polarized semiconductors. So here, um, uh, uh, our uh, experimental collaborator, Phil King at uh, St. Andrews in the, in the UK, was interested in, in looking at electron flow effects uh, uh, you know, in the conduction band. So he performed ARPES experiments. So then, that means the uh, angle is for the electron spectroscopy experiment. So in ARPES, what happens is that you shine light, uh, typically in a synchrotron light source, uh, that extracts electrons. And from that, you can reconstruct the buff fracture of the compound prior to extraction. So uh, in this case, for example, you see that you have a, uh, the P bands uh, that you can see here in the ARPES spectrum, the uh, European F bands here. And then in this ex experiment, what they also did is to dope the system with gadolinium 
So europium has a, is a two plus, a gadolinium is three plus. And so that means that gadolinium injects electrons in the system. So we should see a little bit of signal coming also from the conduction bamboto. So here is not very visible because there is a lot of signal coming from the valence. But if you remove the valence and you enhance the signal here, you actually discover that there is indeed a signal coming from the conduction. Now, in this plot, we were expecting a conduction band looking like a small parabola, okay? But in the experiment, what they observed is something looking like a, a, a blob, let's say. Maybe if you use a bit of imagination, this could be a parabola, a small parabola. But then there are also other features, a, a satellite here, a satellite here, maybe a little bit of a satellite here. And if you look at, uh, uh, if you go measuring the separation between the satellites, that's always 60 million electron volts. And 60 electron volts, uh, by, by coincidence, is the energy of the highest longitudinal optical form in this compound. So the proposal was that this has to do with the, uh, uh, you know, uh, some electron form interactions in the systems. So what we did is to try to do calculations of this effect uh, uh, using these uh, self energies. And that, uh, uh, you know, uh, leads us to reproduce this uh, uh, spectra. So this would be again the same experiment. These are calculations as obviously we don't have all the broadening including the experiment, but you can probably see this uh, first band, the satellite and other satellite. And just to make it more clear, I'm also showing a cut in the middle of this uh, uh, of this band. So if you go down this line, you, you follow essentially the energy here. So you have a first quasi-particle peak. That's the big blob here. Then a first, uh, second, first satellite, a second satellite, a third satellite, okay, that are equally spaced. In the calculation also, if we draw a line in the middle here, then we find uh, a quasi-particle peak, satellite, satellite, and so on, okay? So this is just a way to say that, uh, uh, yes, one can confirm that these satellites are an effect of electron phonon interactions, okay? And in particular, of an interaction with a specific polar optical phonon that is longitudinal optical mode, okay? So that's the, to give you an idea of the level of accuracy one, one can achieve now with uh, you know, these kind of calculations. And then uh, the last example I want to give you before uh, moving to technical details is about calculations of phonons. So in the previous two examples, I told you how phonons affect electrons. So for example, by changing the bulk structures, but uh, also the reverse is true, electrons affect the property of phonons. Usually we don't discuss that because when we perform DFT calculations, um, the, you, know, you calculate the dynamical matrix and you diagonalize those again values, so the phonon, let's say phonon dispersions, already take into account a lot of electron phonon interactions uh, you know, uh, in the static sense. But there is additional interactions that are not captured by the standard density functional perturbation theory approach and can be captured using a, a, a Green's functions formalism. So to do this, one needs to build a self-energy for phonons that is similar to what I showed you for the electrons. So the example I want to show is about diamond. So diamond is a, you know, is a wide gap insulator. You're looking at here at the valence bands. And um, in principle, this should be completely filled. In this experiment carried out by Maurice Hirsch at the, um, uh, uh, at the ESRF in Grenoble, what they did is to dope diamond with boron. So since borons are as, uh, uh, you know, uh, three electrons, uh, this corresponds to doping holes into the valence bands. And that creates at very high doping, a tiny Fermi surface near the top of the valence band. Okay, imagine a, a, a spherical Fermi surface. So if you perform a calculation with density functional theory uh, and uh, you set a Fermi level like that in the calculation, you do discover that uh, the original form of dispersions in blue become softer. So you get the dashed lines. And the reason is that you have more screening coming from this Fermi surface, okay? However, the one issue is at this point was that this softening was too large as compared to experiments. So for example, I can show you the experiments. So these are essentially inelastic excess scattering experiments carried out at uh, uh, the synchrotron in Grenoble. And what you can see here is basically is the phonon dispersions corresponding to this upper branch here of the tampon denote, okay? So the first plot is uh, uh, for the undoped diamond. As you increase doping, you see that uh, the broadening here is increasing and uh, there is a little bit of uh, more pronounced bending. And then as you keep increasing doping to very high levels, the bending continues and the broadening here is such that you almost lose the quasi-particle uh, in, in this region, okay? The problem is that if you do then see functional theory calculations, you find a softening of ab about 20 million electron volts, but in the experiments of the order of uh, five million electron volts. So there is a significant discrepancy. So to fix that, one has to go to many body techniques like the ones I showed you earlier. And this is a, a many body calculation where 
you see uh, the dispersions of uh, undoped diamond. What happens if you uh, start doping? So you have a little bit of bending and uh, increase in uh, broadening. And then the fact that uh, if you keep increasing the, the, the doping, so here you lose completely the quasi-particle signal and the bending is now more pronounced, but this bending is uh, more in line with the experimental value than a brute kind of a, a DFT, a static, let's say a DFT uh, a calculation. So that's to say that there are also techniques to look at how electrons affect the uh, properties of photons. So now let me uh, tell you a little bit about um, uh, the, um, uh, the technical uh, details of these calculations. So what uh, uh, I showed you um, is that, uh, you know, for example, for the electrons, we want to calculate something like a fan middle self energy. It was looking something like that in the you know, uh, previous slides. There was a vertex, and uh, as I said, we neglect that because it is difficult to calculate. So what I want to make uh, discuss here in the next two, three slides is that the most uh, 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 important quantity and also the most difficult to calculate is this uh, red bit, which is the electron phonomatic element, okay? So first, let me uh, uh, tell you what it is, and then I will explain the challenge in calculating it. So this is essentially a sandwich between the uh, two electronic states and the uh, change of the potential associated with the phone, okay? So nothing really complicated. So these are the two, uh, 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 periodic part of block wave functions and is the change of the potential. So uh, you can see this as the probability amplitude uh, to scatter uh, uh, for an electron to go from a state K to a state K plus Q via a phono or wave vector Q. So this, uh, the calculation of the, um, uh, the against states like the Kronschamming states is very simple and also, um, you know, computationally uh, 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 cheap to do. So what gets complicated is the calculation of this change of the self transition potential. So I want to give you the full expression so you, you can see uh, what this is made of. So this is the, the complete expression. So the way it works, uh, at least conceptually, is the following. I take a uh, the self-consistent, let's say the constant potential of a, of a, in a super cell, for example. I, I move an atom in a so atom kappa direction alpha and in a given unit cell. And then this uh, creates essentially a, a dipole. And then I do that for all the atoms in my system. Then I uh, perform a linear combination of those objects, these potentials, using the phonon uh, again mode. So this is the phonon polarization method. This tells me in which direction each atom is moving in a given phonon mode. Then I multiply this by the amplitude of each displacement. So this gives me the direction, but I don't know by how much they move. So this quantity tells me how much they are moving in, in those directions. And then I add the uh, prefactor, which takes into account essentially the the the, the you know, that, that essentially brings a periodicity to the system, and that's the entire uh, uh, potential. So the complexity of calculation of this potential uh, is that, so this can certainly be done with codes like phonon or in abinit, and uh, essentially can be done by a density function perturbation theory. Uh, the, the challenge is that uh, each calculation for each uh, uh, wave vector uh, is almost, uh, or let's say approximately as expensive as a DFT total energy calculations. And one could say, okay, you know, that should not be, uh, uh, you know, too complicated because, you know, I can just calculate maybe, uh, uh, you know, a dozen matrix element and I'm done. So the problem is that that's not really the case and one needs a lot of matrix element to perform calculations. So I was thinking how to explain this concept in a way that sticks and, you know, you can remember it without, uh, uh, you know, going back uh, to these slides. And uh, this is probably my, the best way I have to, to explain it in, uh, you know, in just uh, a few seconds. So let's take an, as an example, uh, the, um, the immers of the electron lifetime coming from electron flow interactions. So if you want, this is uh, proportional to the imaginary part of the fan middle self energy I mentioned earlier, okay? And the, the reason I'm gonna make now uh, applies identically to the real part of self energy. So this uh, calculation uh, can be essentially written as an integral where you have some electron chromatic elements, some prefactors here that uh, we're not gonna bother with. And then there is a direct delta function so this Dirac delta function essentially enforces energy conservation and it tells me that uh, uh, my initial state can decay into a final state that uh, uh, um, is uh, basically uh, uh, removed in terms of energy by plus or minus the phonon energy uh, involved in this process, okay? So let's see what happens uh, you know, in terms of uh, requirement for this matrix element if I consider a simple uh, two-dimensional system with a parabolic electron band. So imagine this being our, uh, let's say a metal that you want to study. You want to look at the, I don't know, the, you know, uh, uh, the, the, you know, the lifetimes, uh, 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 a certain energy. So the energy is something that we set by, uh, you know, deciding the spring plane. 
So what is happening is that my initial, my the state I want to consider is something lying on this circle. And what I need to do here is to perform calculations where I add up all the processes where the, uh, the state can scatter into states that are actually uh, at an energy uh, that is very close to, to itself because it's plus minus one for energy. So approximately we need to say that, uh, we can say that the state scatters on other states that are lying on this circle, okay? So what we want to do is to describe this integration uh, uh, carefully. Suppose you use a, a, a grid of K points in the Brillouin zone, uh, similar to what you do for the you know, electron density in total energy calculations. So let me be brutal and say that we use a four by four grid. So really what you want to describe is a circle in the Brillouin zone, but if you use a four by four grid, you actually obtain a square, okay? So instead of doing, for example, a scattering between um, a state here and other states on, on this white circle, you're scattering with something that is lying on a, on a square. So you lose all the phase space kind of um, geometry uh, that uh, you want to describe. So to achieve something that looks more like a, a, a circle, well, you need a, a finite grid. So if you do, for example, 40 by 40, you discover that now the circle looks uh, more or less like a circle when you pixelize it uh, with this um, discretized blue and zone, okay? So uh, the bottom line in this line is that the problem in calculating these self-energies is that usually we are trying to uh, perform integrals on a domain which is a lower dimension than the Brillouin zone itself. So for a 3D Brillouin zone, we perform integrals that are on a two-dimensional surface. And that's what adds complexity to these calculations. And that's why we need uh, you know, to evaluate many matrix elements usually. So how do we do that? Well, calculations of you know, hundreds of thousands of matrix elements by direct uh, uh, density function perturbation theory are essentially impossible, okay? There's just no chance. So in, the, in this uh, context, uh, you know, 1E functions uh, become extremely useful. So this is just a cartoon to, to, to remind you what a 1E function is. And obviously I don't need to say that in a 1E function school, but uh, the basic idea uh, that is described you know, in, in detail in, you know, in many of the papers, uh, this team, and then also the, this very nice you know, review article, is that we can try to perform a transformation, so a linear transformation between a, a standard, you know, block periodic wave functions and the localized objects, okay? And these localized objects, uh, uh, you know, can be described uh, using, uh, uh, you know, um, a, a generalized one year, uh, Fourier transformation where there is both a uh, kind of phase factor here and a unitary rotation between the bands. Now, in in, uh, in the early work, uh, 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 Marzari Manderbilt, what they realized is that the arbitrariness associated with the, this unitary matrix can be exploited to make the one functions as localized as possible. And it's very useful because then you can exploit concepts that uh, come from you know, type binding, for example. So that's basically the idea. And uh, what uh, we did uh, 15 years ago is to basically uh, just uh, generalize this concept to the case of a phonomatrix element. And the key to this is the fact that an electron phonomatrix element has three components. So two block states, so for those, we can do a rotation to one of functions. And then there is the change of the potential coming from the uh, uh, phonon. So this change, if you remember, maybe I can go back to a couple of slides. If you remember the expression, is a linear combination of uh, essentially uh, 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 dipole potentials coming from the displacement of a single atom. So what one can do is to actually re-extract these dipole potentials from the periodic components. And in practice, what happens is that one can write this, uh, uh, you know, perform a unitary transformation to re-extract the kind of uh, atomic dipole potential associated, uh, you know, uh, that is contributing to the uh, uh, kind of phonon perturbation. So this is by definition something uh, localized, at least in metals. And, uh, and then uh, uh, what one can do is to exploit the fact that uh, this object, this object, and this object, they are all localized. So if you make a matrix element and they're sitting in different unit cells, probably uh, the matrix center will be very small. And therefore you can do uh, uh, concepts like, uh, you can use concepts like uh, uh, Fourier padding and then interpolation. So in practice, what happens is that one can uh, uh, write down a relation between the matrix element in the block representation, the matrix element in a one year representation. So using these three things, this is a, again, a generalized one year Fourier transformation. So the capital U refers to the uh, electronic part the uh, E is the uh, polarization method, so it's the phonon part, and uh, uh, one can go back and forth to exploit this expression. What e one does in principle, in practice, is that uh, one calculates this matrix element on a coarse grid, as usual, then use this expression to exactly determine the matrix element uh, uh, in a real space, then pads the real space with zeros, 
and go, goes back to uh, this expression on any point in the Boolean zone. Okay, and this is something that is very uh, uh, efficient. So just to show you something that is very vintage, so like from uh, again 15 years ago, this was the first calculation on diamond, and you can see that the uh, matrix element here are very very uh, you know highly localized, so they decay exponentially uh, as you you know move away these uh, uh, kind of blobs in the in the in the matrix element, and because of that uh, you can exploit them to essentially follow the the you know uh, reproduce the ab initio matrix element that you would obtain from density function perturbation theory. Uh, but a uh, much uh, you know, lower computational cost. So just to give you an you know, idea of how these things look like for most systems, I want to show you something more recent. This was calculated by uh, uh, Samuel Ponce. Uh, it was published last year. So what he did is to study uh, the current mobility in many semiconductors. And uh, one part of the paper was to look at the, how the matrix element, uh, uh, you know, the atom form matrix element became the systems. So these are essentially the uh, 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 log, log plots of the decay in real space of this matrix element. And, uh, you know, you can see that they, they, they decay pretty fast. For example, let's look at this uh, plot in the middle. So the uh, uh, dark purple are uh, uh, for the valence bands. And you can see that they decay exponentially here. So that's actually uh, uh, co corresponds to what we expect. For the conduction band here, um, since you need to use uh, this entanglement, uh, uh, you don't have this uh, kind of a concept of exponential decay. And you have more something like exponential decay, but still the, the decay is good enough uh, uh, for practical applications. Okay, and uh, this is pretty much as you know something that you find across um, many compounds. So how this is done in practice? Uh, what happens is that uh, we use a, um, a code called EPW that is actually um, uh, uh, distributed uh, as uh, one of the modules of the quantum espresso suite. And the way this works is essentially takes uh, 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 DFPT input. And the constant states from quantum espresso. It takes uh, information about one functions from one in 90, and then uh, you know puts them together to uh, uh, realize this interpolation I described, and then to calculate uh, physical properties uh, 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 such as those that you will see with um, uh, uh, Roxana Margin and Samuel Ponce uh, later. Okay. So just to uh, uh, tell you a little bit about this code. So this is something that started uh, many years ago, and it was a very small operation. But now there is, a, you know, the, the team is growing. And there are uh, several people involved. So apart from us, there is, uh, you know, Roxana Margin at Binghamton. There is Samuel Ponce at uh, Cole Polytechnic in Louvain. There is Manos Kupakis in Michigan. There is Nicola Bonini in uh, King's College in London. And then we also have uh, some new additions uh, with final displacements uh, by Mario Zakaria at the University of Rennes. So it's a nice team that is growing. It's not as big as the, uh, you know, 1A team, but, uh, you know, we are getting there slowly. And uh, uh, just to give you a couple of updates, uh, uh, you know, there's been a lot of work in the code happening during the past three years to push it towards uh, exascale computing. And so uh, Yun Jun Lee uh, here at UT Austin has been refactoring the code to uh, essentially uh, uh, incorporate uh, multi-level open MP and PI parallelization and uh, demonstrate the scaling, uh, you know, to the full in, inside the full machine of Frontera. So it's basically the, uh, you know, the, the it's a, you know, 40 petaflops uh, uh, supercomputer, so 500,000 cores. Uh, so this actually is very encouraging, and hopefully this will become uh, the standard uh, going forward. And now I want to, if I have, uh, uh, you know, two, three other minutes, maybe five minutes, I want to tell you about some research that we are doing, uh, if uh, I'm allowed. Antimo, can I take another five minutes? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Okay. So that basically was an introduction. And uh, what I, I want to tell you now is just uh, something we are, I'm actually very interested in uh, personally, and there's some activity we have been, uh, you know, working on. Um, and it's about polarons, okay? Uh, so I see this as a new frontier of electron photon physics because it's really challenging the way we think about electrons. And then maybe the most striking concept that uh, we're still trying to, to, to kind of uh, uh, understand is that, you know, uh, sometimes uh, when you add or remove electrons uh, to crystals, uh, they may want to localize. So that's actually uh, kind of in contrast to our uh, concept that everything is, uh, you know, block periodic, and uh, you know we have this block theorem that helps us. So polar in a, in a, in a intuitive fashion is basically just a, a, a very simple concept you see in any textbook or in undergraduate textbooks, where you take a crystal that is an insulator, you add an electron or remove an electron, and maybe the interaction with ions is going to be so strong that there's going to be a local distortion, and this distortion may actually pull in the electron in a way that it will actually trap in that place. Okay, and this may lead to all sorts of phenomena. For example, there is a change in uh, maybe in the potential energy landscape, but this could lead to some kind of, uh, you know, interesting shifts in uh, absorption of photoluminescence. 
one could uh, obtain the creation of some uh, defect states in the band gap and things like that. Okay, so I'm not going to say much about this because this has been reviewed by uh, uh, Cesare Franchini and co-workers in this very, uh, you know, extensive, very nice uh, review on this topic. So if you if you might be interested in polarons, I would recommend you to, to to read this article. And uh, uh, you know what we wanted to do is to try to understand whether we can calculate these things so using methods uh, like the ones I described earlier. And uh, so the first question is, you know, okay, what is that uh, we would like to calculate? So the, in this cartoon, what I'm imagining is that uh, we have a kind of a, an insulator or a semiconductor, if you like, with uh, valence bands completely filled, and then you have a conduction band that is empty. Uh, so the dots will be the atoms, and then they generate a potential is periodic, so everything block periodic. Then I add an electron uh, in the conductor. And if I do a calculation in DFT, what is going to happen is that uh, this electron will land into the, so in the ground state, it will be in the conduction by minimum. Uh, since it's in a, it's a bound state, it is also a block state, so it's, uh, it's block periodic, so the density will be periodic. Fine. So that's all we, we used to. Now I can change the perspective and say, okay, what, what if I do the same calculation, not in a unit cell, but in a large supercell, and on top of that, I move the atoms a little bit to create a lump of uh, atomic charge. So basically, I move the atoms a little bit, and then I uh, add an electron. So if I keep the atoms uh, 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 fixed, uh, the electron will, maybe if the distortion is strong enough, the electron might relax around this atom and perform and form some kind of a defect, okay? Now, what I can do is to let the atoms go, essentially relax them, and check whether we go back to this scenario or we go, we stay in a localized scenario, okay? So if we stay in a localized scenario, we say we have a polarum, right? And the question is, you know, can we calculate this with DFT and, you know, how to do that efficiently? So in EFT, there are a couple of issues. So there's one issue which is practical, and that's the fact that uh, um, suppose your polarity is maybe five nanometers or you know, two nanometers, you might need a supercell with maybe 10 or 20 or 30,000 atoms, okay? So uh, uh, that becomes obviously impractical. So one can do it for you know, one system one, once in a while, but you know, it's not something you can do uh, routinely. There is a second problem which is more important, is that you know that in density functional theory, uh, the, the heart tree, uh, contains a the interaction of the electron uh, uh, with itself. So one can prove that that interaction tends to kill the polarum, meaning that it tends to delocalize it, okay? So that's essentially the self-interaction problem of DFT that becomes particularly uh, com complex and uh, challenging in the case of polarums. So to, to, to overcome these things, what we did is to uh, devise a, a simplified format that starts from density functional theory, removes the self-interaction using a self-interaction corrected functional, and then uh, 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 essentially concentrates on the polar wave functions and gets rid of all the valence states uh, uh, in order to simplify the problem, okay? So I'm not gonna go into the de details, but essentially uh, 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 the, the bottom line is that what you're looking at here is the energy difference between um, a system with a, uh, an extra electron and uh, uh, the neutral system with, uh, you know, uh, valence band field and conduction band empty. And uh, the other thing that we did is to truncate uh, uh, essential to expand all atomic displacements or positions um, to second order in displacement. And this is useful because uh, when you work to second order, you can use uh, concepts uh, from uh, phonons, okay? So you can talk about phonons and their interactions with electrons. So this is a new energy function that essentially uh, uh, depends on the wave function of the electron, the extra electron, and the position of the displacement of the nuclei. And what you do when you have a function, you try to find the ground state so to do so, you do a minimization, uh, a variation of the derivative with respect to size star, and the derivative with respect to u sub k. And this leads to two equations. The first one is a modified consumption equation, where there is an extra term that corresponds to the linear electron for interaction. And the second one tells me the relation between the, uh, the electron uh, wave function, so where it's sitting, and then the atomic displacement. So this issue, this, uh, this kind of formulation uh, uh, fixes the problem of the uh, uh, self-interaction but it does not uh, address the problem that uh, I might need a very large supercell to perform this calculation. So to, to also overcome this problem, what we did is something very simple is to observe that, uh, you know, the block functions uh, and the uh, photon polarization matrix form a complete basis uh, for, uh, you, know, um, a, you know, the real space uh, functions. So you can always write down your polarum function as any combination of block states, and you can write any atomic displacement as a linear combination of uh, you know, phonon and eigen displacement. And if you use these two expressions and replace them in the previous equations, you obtain something uh, where we don't need anymore a supercell because everything is expressed in reciprocal space. 
So in particular, we have uh, a nonlinear eigen value problem uh, with uh, uh, two unknown, two sets of unknowns, the A coefficients that describe the electron wave function and the B coefficient that describe the, uh, let's say the atomic distortions. And the ingredients are the electron bands, the phonon dispersions and the electron formal excitements. So everything you can calculate using density function perturbation theory is used here. And then uh, from this, so you can perform a solution and check what happens. So I'm just going to give you two quick examples because I don't want to hold uh, uh, you too long. So this is an example calculation for the electron polar in lithium fluoride. So these are just a rock salt uh, ionic compound. Uh, what we need is to add one electron to the conduction band. And uh, you can see that this is the electron wave function. It is localized, but it is something one we call a large polar. It spans maybe 10 uh, unit cells, okay? And you know, if you were to calculate this, you would need at least 10,000 atoms in your, your, your uh, supercell if you want to do an explicit calculation. So that's why using a, a supervised space formulation is advantageous. In the same system, if instead of adding an electron, you remove an electron, so you create a whole polar, the scenario is completely different. What you find is that this object is, spans only a couple of unit cells, okay? So this is essentially a linear combination of, of two uh, uh, p orbitals, okay? So that's a very small polar, and uh, uh, what is interesting in this context is that in the same crystal, you just look at the valence or the conduction, you find completely different behavior. And this is reflecting the energetics. So if you look, for example, at the energy of formation of the electron polar, this is about 200 millivolts below the conduction of bottom. And in the case of the whole polar, is about 10 times larger. Okay. So this also means that uh, there is a uh, potentially a significant renormalization of band gaps. Uh, and the band structures as well, that comes from the uh, localization effects. And uh, I, do, I will not have time to show this here, but um, we perform additional work to uh, uh, to basically understand how this kind of normalization relates to standard uh, calculations like the allen einer theory, where you want to change, look at the change of band structure with temperature. Well, the bottom line is essentially that uh, uh, both effects have to be taken into account. And uh, this effect is particularly uh, significant when you have small polarons and the energy shifts uh, it is very large. So this is basically a summary of the kind of things that I, I tried to tell you. So we had basically, uh, I, I went through a few examples to show you that uh, one can calculate uh, things like mass structure ionization, affecting masses, uh, lifetimes, uh, 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 you know, effects like, uh, you know, foreign satellites, like people call them polaron satellites in our experiments. One can also look at the, how electrons affect the inspections of phonons in uh, 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 phonon spectroscopy. We start having methods to look at uh, kind of uh, uh, polar localization, and uh, but these things are really in the beginning, so there is a lot of work to be done here. And there is much more that one could do, and for that I think I would refer you to uh, you know, two instructors of the school. So uh, Professor Roxana Margine uh, 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 will tell you about uh, superconductivity and how to do these calculations in the uh, with the EPW code. And then uh, uh, Dr. Samuel Ponce will tell you about uh, carrier transport, you know, for example, mobility, small mobility, and things like that, and uh, uh, how to do these calculations with EPW. And with that, uh, I will just uh, uh, put up a, a knowledge slide. So many people contribute to the slides that, uh, that uh, I mentioned over the years, so, so they're mentioned here. So this is the current group, and uh, this is our funding. And with that, uh, I'm happy to uh, stop here and uh, take questions if there are any. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Feliciano, for the really wonderful talk. So, are there any questions uh, from participants here in Trieste in presence? Please raise your hand. Okay, please, could you come here and speak at the microphone? Thanks. Here. Hi, okay. Thanks for the nice talk. Uh, my question is about the RPS experiment of polarons. So for example, say you consider a electron dope system, then should I understand the RPS experiment as measuring electron polarons in the initial state or as measuring whole polarons in the final state? Oh, you mean this one? Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's a very good point. So this is actually a... Uh, uh, so this uh, system is so it's uh, essentially it's there is electrons doped into the conduction okay so this is really uh, if you want a whole polaron in the conduction okay 
No, is that what you're asking? Because basically, this is the removal of an electron from the system uh, after realizing the dopamine, right? Okay, there's another question here. Uh, while Stefan go to, goes to take the question, I ask if uh, participants connected on Zoom want to uh, write the question in the chat or either uh, you know raise your hand and we will unmute, unmute, the, unmute you for the for asking the question. Okay. Uh, try that, this one. Oh, great. Can you share that with you? Yes, okay. I think it should work. Okay. Um, I have a question about your first sky calculation, and I could see the renormalization of the effective masses. So my question would be, does it help to explain the lifetime in this material, the long lifetime of excitations? Uh, so, say again, sorry, uh, which material you're you referring to? Uh, first sky. Uh, okay, let me see. Okay, so you yes. So you 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 ask whether this uh, the, these lifetimes match experiments? Is that the question? The, 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 um, the long lifetime of optical excitations. Oh yeah, that's a good point. So uh, I, I think there are two different things. So the um, so when people talk about uh, um, uh, long lived car uh, carriers in these compounds, what they refer to is. Uh, that when you create an electron hole pair, uh, it takes a long time before recombining, okay? While in this case, uh, what these lifetimes are is, for example, imagine a, a, a injection in something like, so you're transporting an electron and you want to know uh, how long it stays in that state. So it's more like a scattering lifetime. So there is no concept of recombination. So that requires essentially looking at the band-to-band -band combination and the shock leader, the hole, which is goes for defects. And that basically another piece of physics. Okay, sounds good. Thank you very much. Okay, there is another question here. Maybe, the, okay, maybe just, just the last question here. And if people are on Zoom, uh, no, I don't see any questions on Zoom. So please go ahead. Start Hi, um, thank you for the talk. I was wondering if you have also considered um, have you also calculated, for example, the optical properties, um, considering the electron phonon interaction by way of, for example, the BSC? Oh, yeah, that, that, that's a very nice question. Uh, uh, we, we have not, but we would like to. Uh, so there, there, you know, there is a lot. So there are several papers. So the, the, the issue with that is that I, I think at, at this point, a, a complete calculation with BSC is probably too complicated so different groups have, have basically decided to approximate different things uh, and i think yeah there's still a lot of work to understand you know uh, what needs to be done there in, in my opinion so what we are particularly interested in is to see whether for example now we we, we kind of understand how to do polarons in you know for um, uh, electronic excitations and the question is whether one can find similar objects in optical excitations for example uh, uh, and the other question is, for example, whether one can introduce, uh, you know, uh, lifetimes in, in this uh, BSC calculation. This has been done by, you know, uh, Andrea Marini, by the people in Berkeley at some point. Uh, so there are several options, uh, but there are two, I would say that so many terms there that is not entirely clear which ones uh, one has to keep and which one one can drop. So there one needs really to discuss specific experiments in my view. But you know, I, 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 we haven't done anything yet in this area, so I, I cannot really answer to you know, in, in very detail. Okay, thanks a lot. I think uh, we should stop here. Let's thank again for the channel. Okay, thank you guys. So now there is the coffee break, and then we will start in uh, at ten past four for the last talk of the day by Lin Lin. Thank you.